So a little while ago, my wife and I went an hour west of here to one of those colossal Ikea stores. And, you know, you get in the maze, and, and as happens to men of my age, I urgently sought relief at one point. And as I was standing there in the line of porcelain, a young man at the far end said to me, Professor Miller, I remember you from news literacy, and I want you to know I still deconstruct the news. It was a little awkward. I'm not making fun of his accent. Here at Stony Brook, it is our honor to teach a diverse student body of strivers who include immigrants, first-generation Americans, students from low income. They are marked by their resilience for greatness. In, their, in his accent, I hear the new America singing. It shouldn't surprise you that I didn't recognize him. Uh, we've taught 10,000 undergraduates Stony Brook's unique news literacy course in the last seven years. And I've had myself more than 2,000 of them in lecture, more than 500 of them in the small group recitations. No, what stuck with me was his certitude. His certitude. And it made me nervous. I want to talk about that today. So, I think that we all teach. All of us teach all the time because there's so much demand. And this is why I became a journalist because I love to ask questions, I love to hunt down the answers, and then I love to explain my findings to other people who are curious. And then when I became an editor, I sort of defined my work by that same enterprise. I ran my newsroom as a place of learning and I ran the newspaper as an organ of learning, and then I got to go back to school when I was 47. I went to Harvard on a Neiman Fellowship, and one of the things I learned about was neuroplasticity, and this gave me a lot to think about in teaching, in learning, in journalism, and in democracy. So the thing about the human brain is this. It's this incredible shape-shifting organ that we are the custodians of. And it takes, you know, new information and just absorbs it and organizes it, makes connections to it in a way that really dazzled me. It's important for me to note that democracy is the, the, the context for all of this. The Greeks, under attack by the Persians, decided to widen the circle of decision-making, to let mere citizens handle the sharp instruments of self-governance. It's an incredible thing. Pericles led these reforms. And what we often forget, what we often forget in romanticizing democracy is that people accumulate reasoning skills and information as a way to build power. And so in Greece, as everywhere else, the capacity to manipulate through intense debate grew. There is this feeling. When new information fits what you know, it feels so good. It enlarges what you think. It resonates what you think. And it's addictive. I, I think we're addicted to that feeling of saying, I knew it. I knew it. And as a journalist, I learned how information that does that really pleases people and how information in the hands of the many makes the few mighty nervous. Barack Obama was born in the U.S. of A., George Bush had a terrible GPA, but John Kerry's was even worse. Our laughable baldness is caused by testosterone. So in 2010, in 2010, four researchers took a look at the midterm election. Four researchers from the University of Maryland, and they did two things. They looked at misinformation, 
factual inaccuracies, mischaracterizations in the press, and they asked voters what they knew about the important issues that were being debated in this election. So they asked about the economic recovery program, or the economic recovery, they asked about climate science, they asked about the TARP program, they asked about taxation. The results were a bit scary. When they asked people if your federal personal income taxes had gone up or down or stayed the same, 86% of voters got it wrong. That's pretty scary. These are the people who are deciding who's going to be the new Congress midway through the president's term. Oh, the fox hunters had a field day. Because the people who were the most misinformed were the people who paid the most attention to Fox News. Talk about harmony. This was sweet music to the critics of Fox News. And they include a scary number of people who think they're smart enough to censor somebody like Fox News, to shut them up. Those critics forgot that correlation, can you finish with me, is not causation. So most of those critics didn't get deep enough into the study to find this little gem. Even the daily consumers of news sources with the lowest levels of misinformation still included substantial numbers of people who carried around misinformation. One striking feature is that substantial levels of misinformation were present in the daily consumers of all news sources. In other words, the consumers of the news were the problem as much as or more than the creators of that information. So, some of you are still arguing with that bit that I did about Kerry and Bush, aren't you? You're thinking, thinking, no, no, there's no way. Bush, better grade point average than Kerry? Believe it. Believe it. If you look at their official transcripts from Yale, Bush staggered to the finish line with a 77, baby, and Kerry with a 76. Here's some other things maybe you can't handle. Can you handle this? Johannes Vermeer, the absolute genius of painting technique, that photorealistic brushwork of his can be easily reproduced with a simple technology that was available at the time, putting his level of photorealism within reach of dedicated paint dabbers. ADHD and poor behavior still occur in children with sugar-free diets. We don't know if baldness is caused by testosterone or by the wimpy little follicles on bald men. What happens to our porous sponge when it encounters new information that contradicts what we know? It's like nails on a chalkboard, isn't it? That horrible dissonant sound, we hate that. It turns out, it turns out that harmony matters more to humans than truth. Social psychologists have documented how if we are not acting consonant with our values, if new information is dissonant with what we believe, that is a deeply uncomfortable state of being for a human. It may be one of the most powerful motivators of human behavior. There's a name for this. Cognitive dissonance. Now, our most craven response to cognitive dissonance is like a diving bell that we pull over our head to block out the stuff that we don't want to hear. The stuff that makes us uncomfortable just bounces right off. It doesn't even get absorbed by that lovely pink organ that I'm so in love with. Ignorance is not really bliss. Ignorance is not bliss. Do you know what true bliss is? True bliss is that I knew it feeling that you already know everything you need to know. 
That, my friends, is bliss. So, our responses to those feelings of cognitive dissonance are many, but the major ones are things like selective distortion and retention. We literally, it's been tested again and again, we literally weed out the parts of new information that we don't like, and we don't remember them, and we retain the stuff we do like. We can't even hear it. We can't even hear it. We forget. We are really good at remembering content, and we're really good at forgetting the source of the content. So I may go out to my car this afternoon, and there may be a flyer under there that tells me something I really want to know. Bald men got lots of testosterone. And by two days from now, I'll have forgotten where I got that information, and I'll be saying, you know, I read in the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> right? Confirmation bias, to me, is the creepiest one. We really don't have a lot of time and energy for new information. So what we do is we seek out the stuff that confirms what we already believe. If we're conservative, we go to Fox News. If we're liberal, we go to MSNBC. We're not really searching for truth. We're searching for love. We want confirmation of our beliefs. While we're at it, when the evidence is ambiguous, when the evidence is ambiguous, we interpret it as being supportive of what we already know. So then I went to talk to Dr. Nancy Franklin, a colleague of mine here at Stony Brook. I wanted to interview her to help students understand this phenomenon of audience bias, the internal barricades between us and absorbing the truth. And what she explained to me is that we don't merely collect and replay data like a video camera. No, no, we're a sophisticated cognition machine. We add context. We fit incoming information to the existing knowledge we already have. We have way more confidence in our senses than is warranted. And here's the scary one. When we retrieve memories, we may change them. Not always, but we, we will change them sometimes when we put them back. That little, well, let's see, how big was that fish that I caught? <sighs> Right? It's terrifying how swampy it is in there. I thought of that lovely absorbent sponge, the, the neuroplasticity that I had studied at Harvard, and I said, Nancy, you're breaking my heart. And she said, take a number. <laughs> so, what am I doing? Teaching students that they can use this leaky, idiosyncratic perceiving cognition and memory system to deconstruct the news, to make decisions as citizens. I mean, Socrates was put to death for leading students astray. I'm in trouble. Can my students really dispassionately evaluate and then take responsible action? The certitude of that student that I met at Ikea that day was a really good thing for me because it put me on notice that I have to redouble our efforts in the news literacy course to teach students humility. That's not exactly an academic subject, but it's a crucial habit of mind. So we simultaneously teach students this methodical method of evaluating sources and analyzing evidence and looking for fairness and breaking down the language and then arriving at a conclusion about the reliability of the information. We simultaneously teach them that their brain is completely whack, <laughs> that their cognition system is seriously compromised by their humanity. It won't inoculate them against those things. It won't inoculate them against those habits of mind that we have. But it may slow them down in making decisions. So, I take comfort. I worry, but I take comfort in the fact that Jefferson and Madison knew that we were headed for the kinds of elections in which falsehood would be rampant, in which people would cave in to the very human notion that they know, that they can know. Because these guys, they didn't have cognitive dissonance, but they had Plato and Socrates saying, 
only a fool thinks they know anything. The framers knew all this and they still banned censorship. They banned censorship. They still sided with Pericles, who said citizens can govern themselves. They still sided with Milton, who said that the only path to a civilized society was across a battlefield where truth and error were given an equal chance to fight. The soul of democracy lies in Madison's observation that by setting information, all information, free, Gutenberg had guaranteed the truth will out. This was the battlefield that Milton was talking about. Let all this crazy stuff, true and false, come to combat and eventually we'll come to the right decisions. Can the wisdom of this policy, Madison said, be doubted by anyone who reflects that to the press alone, and he's not talking about the press corps, he's talking about the repurposed wine press, that to the press alone, checkered as it is with abuses, the world's indebted for all the triumphs which have been gained by reason over error and oppression. It's not the publisher or the broadcaster or the tweeter in whom the framers placed their faith. It's certainly not to the, in those who have the foolish belief that they are wise enough to censor. It's that student out there in the world using his or her abilities, using this methodical system that we've given them, rating the information that they're bombarded with every day, deconstructing the news. Today, I wanted to talk about why I work so hard now to temper my students' certitude with humility. I can always do a better job of that. It's a problem, the fact that we have too much confidence in our abilities. It's a problem, but it's a problem worth working on. Thank you very much.